Welcome, and thank you for listening to Sandy Creek Stirrings. I'm your host, Joshua Jimenez. And if you're going to win souls, you've got to love souls. In spite of their meanness, in spite of the way they look, in spite of everything, you've got to seek to bring souls to Jesus Christ because you love them, because Jesus loved them, and because Jesus died for them, and you're trying to bring them to the Son of God. The Bible says in Psalm 84, 11, my last verse, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. I based my whole life on that, that it pays to serve God, and I believe that law of my heart. God has given us a guidebook. God has given us a directional map, and that guidebook, that map, is the precious Word of God. Listen, don't just go and sit in the pew. Find some way to serve and serve as a family. Be a part of everything at church, and when you learn to love what God loves, um, your children will learn to love it as well. Homes are not that spiritually strong. We're getting overtaken by the world quickly, but unfortunately, we're pumping all the sewage in. You know, we're letting the world in when that ought to be a haven. Well, I'm so excited for today and this episode of Sandy Creek Stirrings. Today, we are doing something that I've been saying for a little while now that I want to do here on the podcast. We are renewing, we are revising our old episodes entitled The Bible Version Debate. The Bible Version Debate, that was a three-part series, actually one of our very first series um, other than Baptist History that we put out here on the podcast. I'm looking at my episode list to get the episode number, but they started back episode 17, episode 20, and episode 23. So very early in the podcast, that was 220 episodes or so ago. And um, I've learned so much more about the Bible versions since we um, released that series. And so for quite some time now, I've wanted to revise and renew that series here on the podcast. And we're going to entitle it this time, Making the Bible Version Debate Simple. Making the Bible Version Debate Simple. Um, This episode series that we're going to put out now is going to be a four-part series. And what we are going to do is, is we are going to take and basically this will replace that old series. And so if you go back to look at the Bible versions, we're going to put a little note there that says, hey, come listen to the new series on making the Bible version debate simple. Now, I'm going to do a couple things. I'm going to make this a four-part series, and then we're actually going to have a fifth part to this series. And that's going to be a Q&A. If you have a question about Bible versions, you have a question about the King James Bible, let me encourage you to send that in. You can email me, joshua at sandycreekstirrings.com. Again, that is joshua at sandycreekstirrings.com. I am so excited. This is one of my favorite subjects to be able to put out. And so this is something that I'm really excited for to be able to reproduce this uh, this series here for you. Now today I'm dealing with a little bit of a head cold. You may hear it in my voice, sound a little bit nasally probably. Um, but we're going to be playing for you. I did this series at my church. And uh, so if you want to watch a video version of this instead of just uh, listening to the podcast, you can go to the YouTube and, and type in Victory Springs Independent Baptist Church. You'll find there a playlist entitled Making the Bible Version Debate Simple. But since this is a podcast, I'm going to be reproducing some of those. I'm not going to be taking them and just uploading them to our podcast. I'm actually going to re-record and put in some different things from that series that I preach. So it's going to be different from the YouTube channel to the podcast episodes. So... But what we are going to be doing in this episode is, is I'm going to be putting my introduction message. I'm going to be putting that straight onto the podcast from when I preach that. So this will be the message that I've already preached. And then the next episodes to follow that will continue this series will be recorded as a podcast episode. There were many different illustrations and visuals that I had within the series when I preached it at my church, and we did video recordings of those. Obviously, with a podcast, this is an audio platform, and so you won't be able to see some of those visuals. So I want to re, um, I want to re-record each of these episodes for you, each of these parts in this series, so that you can get the 
best listening experience. And so we'll re-record those. But for today, I wanted to go ahead and at least give you the introduction episode where I covered some some of the very um, basics of the Bible version debate, some things you need to understand if you're going to understand the Bible version debate and why it is so important. So here it is, making the Bible version debate part one, making it simple, part one, and this is the introduction episode. So my friend, I hope you enjoy this. Looking forward to next time, we'll, we'll be recording the very next part of making the Bible version debate simple. But until next time, keep looking up and keep stirred up for the cause of Christ. Ephesians chapter 6 tonight. Ephesians chapter number six, and don't you love the bus ministry and what it does, amen? It's such an exciting ministry, and oh, I'm looking forward to the many more kids who will ride the buses and come to church, and I say buses right now, we've got vans and expeditions, and uh, but I, I can't help but call it a bus ministry. It just doesn't sound normal calling it a van ministry, and uh, but it is what it is, and we're excited about what the Lord is doing, and I thank the Lord for AJ and Brenna just being willing to run that. It's not a uh, it's not a light commitment. It's a it's a big commitment. You know, there's a lot of people who are not willing to run the bus ministry because of the commitment required. It's an every week thing. You can't pick up kids three weeks in a row and say, well, hey, we're not going to pick you all up next week. That's not the way it works. It's an every week for the rest of your life type thing. And um, so, but praise the Lord for them and for that. Uh, tonight, we're going to go ahead and begin this uh, making the Bible version debate simple. And uh, what I want tonight is for you to, as preacher said, grab a pen and a piece of paper and begin to write things down and uh, look at some things. And so we're going to take a look and answer a couple questions tonight. This is kind of going to be an introductory type uh, message, type lesson into the subject of Bible versions. And so we're going to really answer two kind of topics tonight. And the first one we're going to kind of talk about for a little bit is why would we take the time to talk about this? Uh, many churches would not take the time to talk about this type of subject, and, and some might even ask, is it really that important? I mean, is it really so important? We don't have better things to talk about on a Sunday night to preach on than the Bible versions. Is it really that big of a deal? It's a fair question. That's a fair question. I mean, it is a, a question to ask what we do with the time spent in this pulpit. All right. That's something that the preachers up behind this pulpit will have to answer to the Lord for. What did you do with the time spent behind that sacred desk? And is it really worth spending a couple Sunday nights, uh, four Sunday nights in particular is what we're looking at, talking about this one subject? And um, I think it is, but I, I want you to see that for yourself. We're going to talk about some things tonight from the book of Ephesians, chapter number 6, and we're going to move around. And then when we get into our second topic, you might say, of tonight, all surrounding the Bible version debate, um, we'll take a look at some more passages. I want you to see a lot of things from Scripture. And um, this subject has been something that I've really enjoyed studying out ever since my freshman year of college. Um, you heard me tell this story during the winter revival, but I was driving with a group of friends over to San Francisco. We were going to tour San Francisco. We were right there in the Santa Clara Valley. And uh, or the Silicon Valley and Santa Clara, you know, where all the corporations, I was going to say are, most of them have moved, and uh, but where they were, and uh, but we went over to San Francisco, and we were just talking about all kinds of different subjects, and I had one young man in that car, we began talking about Bible versions. And I just began spouting off the stuff that I had always heard, you know, the simple stuff, the King James Bible is the Word of God, and it has all the words of God and all that, and he put me in a corner on that. And he put me in a corner. It's not that he didn't believe the same as I did, but he knew something that I didn't know about myself until that moment. I may have believed it, but I couldn't prove it. I may have believed it, but I couldn't prove it. And here's the problem with the average Christian sitting in churches across America is they may believe whatever they believe about the Bible, but the problem is most of them can't prove it from the yeah. Word of God. Right. Most of them can't prove it from verifiable facts. Most of them can't prove it without using a, a circular argument. And so tonight we're going to begin talking about some of these different things and looking at this subject. I, I really enjoy this subject, maybe more than most. And I, I'm, a, I'm a debate guy. I love debates. I love listening to debates. I know uh, some of you despise debates, presidential debates. Those are my thing. I enjoy a good debate. Well, I can argue with somebody about anything. And it's probably not a good thing. But uh, my dad knows that very well. 
And uh, but I tell you what, I enjoy listening to debates. And so when he put me, that friend of mine put me in a corner on this thing of you can't prove it. I began to study out this subject of the Bible versions. And really, I started off with a blank slate. You know what? You, you can have all the ideas, preliminary ideas you want in your head. But when you begin to study out something, it's important to go to it and say, you know what? What does the word of God say? And that's the important thing. Sometimes we can, and Brother Summerdorf was talking to us about this uh, after one of the services. He said, sometimes we can go to the Word of God and we can lay a template over it and see only what we want to see. I don't want that for you tonight, and I don't want you to take even my template. I want you to let the Word of God speak for itself. And let's take a look at some things from the Word of God. We're in Ephesians chapter number 6, and we're kind of answering that question in the first part. Why take the time? Is it really that important of a subject? Ephesians chapter 6, I want you to look at verse number 11. It says, put on the whole. How much? The whole. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Put on how much of the armor of God? The whole armor of God. Let's pray tonight and we'll continue on this topic. Lord, I do thank you for this evening once again. Lord, I'm so glad that we are in a place tonight that preaches your word. And Lord, I'm so glad that you love us enough that you want us to know the truth. Lord, you haven't hidden it. It's not behind some rocks or somewhere hidden where we can't find it. Lord, you have given us the truth. And you said, we shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Lord, tonight I pray that truth would be plain and clear. Lord, I pray that you'd speak through me and that you'd touch hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God in His infinite wisdom gave every single um, person a suit of armor for one particular purpose. You are in a battle. You're in a battle. You have an enemy. You have someone who wants to destroy you. We talked about this last week and Wednesday, 1 Peter 5, 8. You have somebody who wants to devour you. You have somebody who wants to ruin you. He doesn't like you. He thinks you're a terrible thing and he wants to ruin your life. And you're in a spiritual battle. And the Bible tells us so often we think and we get so focused on flesh and blood. We get so focused on what's Russia going to do and are they going to move into Ukraine? That's not the important thing. The Bible tells us what our battle is against. Look at verse number 12 of this same chapter. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. God said, hey, yeah, there's some battles in flesh and blood, but let me tell you, that's not your foe. That's not your enemy. You are in a spiritual battle, and Satan wants to ruin you. He wants to destroy you. This is a spiritual battle. It's time to get your spiritual head in the game. And in verse 13, the Bible tells us what we should do if we plan to stand and to stand strong in this spiritual battle. Notice what he says in verse 13. Wherefore, because of this battle you are in, that's what wherefore means. Wherefore, take unto you the whole, again he says whole, the whole armor of God that you can do what? That ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. God wants you to have this suit of armor so that when the evil day comes and the battle is at its worst, you can stand and can do everything to stand because you have this armor of God. And so he tells us to not leave a single piece undone, but to take every single piece of this armor. That's why God says, take unto you the what? The whole armor of God. In the next verses, you know these verses well. He begins to give us what these pieces of armor are. Look in verse number 14. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation. Look up here for a second. Don't read any further. All these pieces of armor up to this point are defensive. Now, you can do a lot with a good defense, can't you? I mean, you go back, and if we were to look at football, you look at those championship teams of old, they had really, really good defenses. But if you don't have a way to be on offense, why, you could never win anything. 
Yeah, this, but all these pieces are given for your safety. They're given for your protection. They're given to keep you safe. And there's only one article of this entire suit, this entire array of armor that God gives you as an offense, a way to fight back. And notice what that is in the rest of that verse, verse 17. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. God gave you a weapon that is forged in the mighty hand of God, which the Bible says was formed before the foundations of the world. God took on that eternal anvil and he beat together the sword that he hands to you for your spiritual battle. Can I tell you this? No earthly sword will stand against the principalities and the powers and the darkness and all the things that he talked in verse 12. They won't work against that. You can have the nicest, the sharpest sword. You can go to that legendary samurai sword that you look at it and it cuts you. That won't work against the principalities in the darkness. It just won't. God gives you a sword, which is the word of God. And that enemy we have over here, well, he knows about that sword. Why, in fact, when he went to tempt our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he was stabbed with it every time Jesus said, it is written, it is written, it is written. He received another stab, stab wound from that sword. And if you go back and look through the times of history and what we talked about last Sunday night, the devil does not like that sword. It hurts. It can slice him. It can rip him. It can dice him. It can crumple him. It can kill him. It can ruin him. And he doesn't want anything to do with that sword. So, so here's what Satan did. He came along and he said, well, he said, I've got an enemy and they've got a pretty powerful weapon. It's the word of God. I, I, I can't have that. If I'm going to win, I got to get that sword out of their hands and I need to replace it with something that feels like it's a sword, but it's not really a sword. Uh, you know, it, it's, it'll, it'll deal some blows. It's sharp in some places, but it, it's no sword. And, you know, the devil has wor always worked in half-truths. And you can see how he's always attacked the Word of God. Even from the very beginning, his first earthly words ever spoken, he said in Genesis 3, 1, Yea, hath God said? Yeah. Didn't your God said that? Are you sure? Questioning the Word of God. You know, Satan is best at using half-truths. By the way, I don't know why we call it that. A half-truth is a whole lie, but, we, but he's best at using half-truths. He has a great way. The Bible calls him cunning. He has a great way of going and taking, oh, that's good, and combining it with something totally wicked and something totally evil. He's good at using half-truths. And the devil wants to take that sword out of your hand, that offensive weapon he's given you, and give you something to replace it that is really no sword at all. You say, what's his plan? I believe we can see that plan. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13. We're going to turn there. And before we actually get into that passage, I want to give you a little background. We don't have enough time to read the entire passage tonight. But turn to 1 Samuel chapter 13. Remember, history repeats itself. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, there is nothing new under the sun. Any tool, anything Satan does, any ploy that Satan uses, it's not new. He's done it before. He'll do it again. And he just repackages it. And I believe we can see some things tonight from 1 Samuel 13. Let me give you a little bit of history of what was going on in this passage. You know the Philistines. Of course, they had their mighty man of valor, that giant Goliath who would show up four chapters from now. The Philistines were the hated, the despised enemies of the people of God. And for years and years and years and years and years, the Philistines and the Israelites had been having war back and forth. You go back to the book of Judges, the Philistines won a lot of those wars. But now Israel's gotten secured in their land. They've got uh, King Saul to kind of lead them and to guide them. And boy, the Philistines haven't had a victory in quite some time. It's been a difficult past few wars. I mean, it's not looking too good. They need to do something because the enemy is winning. So the Philistine, their heads of government get together and they say, we need to come up with a plan. And I don't know who, but one guy raises his hand. He says, I have a good plan. He says, here's what we're going to do. He said, we're going to make a peace agreement with Israel. And can you imagine all the guys slamming their fist on the table? No way, we'll never do it. He said, no, 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 here's what we're going to do. We're going to make a peace agreement with Israel. 
And of course, in a peace agreement, you've got all these different things that you've got to be in accordance with. And one of the things we're going to do is, is Israel, when they sign the peace agreement, they have to agree to lay down all their swords. And what we'll do is, to re in place of those swords, we're going to give them garden tools. We're going to give them shovels and axes, and we're going to give them plows and coulters and mattocks, and we're going to give them goads and all these different things, and, and we'll give them free sharpening. They can come down and they can get their goads sharpened and their plows sharpened and their shovels sharpened and their axes sharpened. And what we'll do is, is they also won't have any blacksmiths. King Saul will have to say he'll shut down all the blacksmith shops. They won't be able to make any swords. And when they've become comfortable with the garden tools and the free sharpenings, then we'll attack. You say nobody would agree to that plan. Who would do that? Look at verse number 19. Look at verse number 19. The Bible says, Now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, Lest the Hebrews make them what? Swords or spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share and his coulter and his axe and his mattock. Yet they had a file for the mattocks and for the coulters and for the forks and for the axes and to sharpen the goads. So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan. But with Saul and with Jonathan and his, uh, his son was there found. And the garrison, uh, garrison, I'm sorry, of the Philistines went out to the passage of Michmash. So here you have, in, if you were to look in verse number 17, the Philistines have seen that Israel has become comfortable with these garden tools. They've agreed to this peace agreement. And you'll see in verse 17, the Bible says that the Philistine spoilers have started to come and they're congregating around the land of Israel because they're about to rush in and they are about to spoil the land. They are about to attack. Why? Because Israel has laid down their sword. They have laid down their weapons. Can I ask you tonight, what did Jesus say in Ephesians chapter 6 that he wants you to equip yourself with? He wants you to pick up a sword. He said, pick up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The problem is, is that Satan comes along and he says, well, why don't you just lay down your sword and I'll give you a garden tool. I'll give you something. It's sharp in a few places. Oh, an axe. I mean, you can deal some pretty good blows with an axe. That's a pretty good weapon. You should use this. I'll sharpen it for you. But the problem is, is an axe, a shovel, a garden hoe, a, a plowshare. Well, none of those are a sword. Right. And the Bible says God wants you to have a sword. Yeah. Pick up the sword, the spirit, the sword of the spirit. God wants you to take up a sword. We are in a battle. We are in a spiritual war. And when it comes time to fight, God says, take up the sword. The question we have is, which sword is he talking about? You say, what do you mean? AmericanBible.org says that there are over 900, over 900, I believe it's over 1,000 now, but over 900, whether complete or incomplete, English translations of the Bible. And when God says to you Christians, modern day Christians, by the way, his word still speaks today. He says, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the sword. Which one is he talking about? I don't know. I don't know if you know this. I'm pretty sure you do. Dr. Curtis Hudson used to say it all the time. But things that are different are not the same. There's a lot of differences between all these different versions. They can't be the same. And if they're if they can't if they aren't the same, then, well, that tells you they can't all be the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So which one is he talking about? You know, tonight more than ever, maybe, Satan wants you to lay down your sword. He wants you to lay down your sword and to pick up something that, oh, it's sharp in some places. Oh, it'll, it'll deal some blows, but it's not a sword. It's just a garden tool. You say, why would you take time on so many Sunday nights to talk about this subject? Because it's really the question of a garden tool versus a sword. You say, that's just your conclusion. That's just your opinion. You can say that for now, but let's talk about the facts over the next couple, four weeks and see what we say then. But that's what the importance of this subject is. It's no small 
issue. God has a lot to say about His Word. Bible version debate, as mentioned, is no small issue. It's, uh, you know, there are many different arguments, many different sides, many different opinions for what people say, and it can often be clouded. The answers can often be clouded by the big jargon and language they use and words they use. And so we're going to do our best over the next four weeks to just kind of simplify this, answering some of the questions. I am literally amazed by some of the preachers and different people I've heard who will get up in a pulpit on both sides and will spout off things that are simply not true. They're circular. They're not logical. They're not factual. And so tonight and the next couple weeks, I want to give you some things that are not my opinion. Look, I don't care about my opinion, and this pulpit should not care about my opinion. And I, I don't mean to be mean, and this may sound mean. I'm not meaning to be mean, but I don't really care about your opinion either. I care about what is the facts, what are what is the truth, Amen. and what does the Word of God have to say on this subject. That should be the most important thing. And let me tell you something. If you've already got your opinions and you've already said, well, I've already decided, then this probably isn't going to help you. Because I want to get back down to the roots of this subject and take a look at what is the truth on this subject of the Word of God. So we're hoping to answer many questions. Um, questions like, is the King James Bible really the only one that's right? Well, isn't it just the originals, the Greek and Hebrew? Aren't they just the ones that are perfect? Is it true that there is no perfect Bible? Does this really matter? We're going to try and answer those over the next four weeks and see what we can get to. So grab your pens, grab your pieces of paper, get ready to write things down, and we'll listen closely as we talk about making the Bible version debate simple. I want to answer one more question, then we'll get into our main area for tonight. We won't take long with it. Um, some people might say, Brother Josh, aren't you a biased source? You were raised in an independent, fundamental Baptist home. You were raised that the King James Bible is the Word of God. Aren't you a biased source? I have written a little mini book that I'm hoping we can put out at some point here, but I, I want to read you just the introduction for what I wrote for that book and see if I can answer that question of if I'm a biased source. Now, please, don't judge me on the very first sentence I read. Allow me to finish that because some people might be, oh my goodness, just wait until I finish. Uh, here's the introduction that I wrote, and I'm literally going to read it to you. I am going to shock you. I am not against a modern English translation of the Bible. So long as it meets the qualifications of God's Word as defined biblically and logically, as we'll see in this study. I wanted to state this in the introduction so that you would know clearly where I stand. I am not against a modern English translation of the Bible. I'm going to give you another statement to make clear another point on which I stand. There has only been one English translation in history that has been able to meet the standards of that criteria. All others have failed. This is not my conclusion or personal opinion. It's a fact. This book that you're holding is not your typical... Run, or, uh, well, this book, this study we're doing, is not your typical run-of-the-mill Bible version ramble. It contains no one-sided arguments or circular arguments. I care not about my opinions or feelings, and frankly, nor yours either. Yes, I literally wrote that. I care about the truth. And so in this study, we take the common debate of the Bible translations and bring the cookies down to the bottom shelf. I desire for you and I to walk away having a better grasp of our stand concerning this matter. We will give biblical standards, concise doctrine, verifiable facts, and logical arguments. I encourage each and every single person to study for themselves and research the facts. In doing this, I believe that someone desiring to know the truth can arrive at the correct destination. This issue is critical to our faith. Let there be no doubt about it. May this be a charge to stir up a love for God's Word in you. And so... So that's what we're going to look at tonight. Now let's take a look at, we'll get to kind of the meat of the subject, and this is really what I want to get to, on the foundational issue of this Bible version debate. And when considering this topic, I really want you to understand it is an important one. Yes. This is an important subject. You say, why? I want you to write this down in your notes, because the Bible, here's why it's an important one, because the Bible is our sole authority in all matters of faith and practice. The Bible is our sole authority in all matters of faith and practice. Now, when I say faith, I'm referring to what we believe about God. 
And when I say practice, I'm referring to how we live our lives based on our belief in God. There are some things we believe about God. Why? Because of the Word of God. And there are some things we do because we know God and we love Him. Well, then we practice. We don't lie. We don't want to be selfish, right? We want to love, we want to love other people. Those are all practices of our life because of our faith. What is that soul authority? Is it education? Oh, I hope it's not education. Is it man? Is it science? No, the Bible is our sole authority in all matters of faith and practice. I used to, when I first began teaching on this subject of Bible translations, I used to say that the Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Then I began to study that out and I thought, you know what? I disagree with that completely. It's not our final. We don't go to the Bible after we've gone to education and man and science and say, well, finally, we can go to the Word of God. No, it is our sole authority. I don't care what anybody else says. I care what the Word of God says. So it is our sole authority in all matters of faith and practice. If you lose that living miracle you are holding in your hands, which that book, that Bible is a living miracle. If you begin to lose some of the things in that word of God, it will affect not only your faith, but it'll affect your practice as well. So it's a big subject. It's a big topic. It's an important one. You know, that Bible literally is a book that we place so much faith and trust in. But I am so thankful it's not just an ordinary book. Oh, there's never been a book that has been more attacked than the word of God, but it's never faded away. No man's been able to wipe it out. No country, no government, no anything, no laws, no religions that tried to come in and stamp it out could stop this Word of God. That tells you there is something special about this book that you hold in your hands. And when you look at the actual contents itself, just give you some basic just figures right here. The writing of the Bible spans over 1,500 years, was written by 40 different authors through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. It has 66 books, and it's perfect. It doesn't have a single error, a single imperfection, a single contradiction. Only God can do that. Can you imagine getting 40 of you? If I were just to select 40 of you tonight and say, hey, I want you to go in different places. Some of you will know each other and, you know, get to each other, but some of, most of you won't. Most of you won't, you know, you're not going to talk to each other, but I want you to write a book, not a little book, a big book. I want you to write a book on God and what we believe about God and, you know, what we should do because of our belief. How many of you would think that everybody would agree? Oh, it'd be great. No, contra no, there'd be contradictions and errors and you would agree with that, disagree with that person. They, uh, it would be a mess. You realize most of these authors, uh, some of them knew each other, but most of them did not. Yeah. Most of them didn't know each other. These people who say it's just a big conspiracy, it is not. There's no way that over 1,500 years, 40 different men could write a book and they all agree. That's, right. That's incredible. You are holding a living miracle in your hands. And so as we begin to look at this Bible version debate, when we examine any doctrinal issue, especially one like this, it's important to note first the facts and then begin to go into the rest of it. So tonight I don't want to give you five basic facts about the Word of God, what the Word of God says about itself. And I'll tell you this, if we get to the end of these five and you say, I don't believe that, this series is not for you because it won't help you. If you're not willing to believe what the Word of God says about itself, then what can you really expect to believe about the Word of God? You have just placed a template over it and said, God, your word has to meet my criteria. Let me give you five basic facts, all right? Number one, the basic facts about the word of God. These are the foundation. These are the lenses we are going to look through as we go deeper into the study over the next few weeks. Number one, the first thing we must believe about the word of God is number one, the Bible is, not could be, but the Bible is the inspired word of God. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Turn over there with me. We're going to turn to a bunch of places tonight. So here's what I'm going to do for sake of time. Once I get there, I'm just going to go ahead and start reading it. If you need to write it down in your notes, please do so. But for sake of time, we've got to go kind of quickly. But first thing we must believe is the Bible is the inspired Word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 16 says, How much? All. Say that word with me. All. Say it again with me. 
all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Inspiration, that, that Greek word there is literally, it's theos neustos, which literally means God breathed. These are the words of God. God breathed them. God gave them. These are not words that man, pen, that man penned down in his own accord. Each author was literally penning down the words of God. Paul wasn't writing from his opinions or from what he thought. God breathed those words and he wrote them down. You say, how do you know that? Write this passage. I'll read it to you. But it's 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 21. 2 Peter 1, 21. It says, for the prophecy... For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but the but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Here's what happened. If I can put that down for you in kind of this idea, my wife will often sit down at the computer and I'll dictate an email to her. And she helps me out in that way. Sometimes she'll uh, write a, a, a letter out for me. So if I told my wife, hey, take this down, write this down for me. I'm going to write a letter to so-and-so. And she, she grabbed a pen and a piece of paper. And I said, dear so-and-so, I hope you've had a wonderful... And she goes down and she writes all these things. And at the end, I take the pen and I sign it. And we fold that letter up. We put it in the envelope. We slap a stamp on it and we send it off. Let me ask you this. Whose letter is it? It's a simple question, right? It's my letter. It's my letter. I'm the one who gave the words. But wait a second. No, it's Miss Tabitha's letter because she wrote it. No, that's not the way that works. It's my letter. They are my words. They're my thoughts. They're what I said. She simply just penned down my words. That's what inspired. If we can put it, just boil it down to the basics. That's what inspiration is. They pen down the very words of God. When somebody says, well, man just wrote that book, they are disagreeing. And they are contradicting what the word of God says about itself. When God said that prophecy came not by the will of man, meaning man didn't will this book into existence, but holy men, as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, it was theos neustos. It was God breathed. It is the inspired word of God. Do you believe that? Yes. Amen. Let's go to number two. Number two, God said, not I said, not you said, God said that his words are perfect and pure. God said that his words are perfect and pure. Look at Psalm 19. Psalm 19, and some of this stuff is just review for most of you. I believe that, I, I don't know that we have anybody in here who would disagree with what I've said up to this point, but Psalm 19:7. So some of this is just review, but it's important that we lay the groundwork. Psalm 19 and verse number 7, the law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. I want you to notice what it says. The law of the Lord is perfect. Write this, write this reference down. I'll read it to you, but it's Proverbs chapter 30 and verses 5 through 6. Proverbs 30 verses 5 through 6 says, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee and thou be found a liar. Every word of God is pure. Continuing an idea, you know, the Bible says that it's inspired, meaning that it's God's words, not man's word. Let me ask you this. Can God do anything imperfect? No. So if God inspired it, that must mean that those words are perfect. And that means that it agrees with point number two, that God said His words are perfect and pure. That means they're without error, they're without blemish, they're without inconsistency, they're without in contradiction. They are perfect, they are pure. There is no debating what God said about His word. Every word of God is pure. If you come to me and say that word is wrong, well, you've just contradicted what the word of God said. He said that every word of God is pure. If it's wrong, it can't be pure. And if it's pure, it can't be wrong. Number three, write this down. Number three, God's word should not be added to or taken away from. God's word should not be added to or taken away from. Um, Proverbs, of course, 3, 5, and 6, we just read. It says, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. But then turn to Revelation chapter 22. 
Of course, you've heard this passage before, Revelation 22. And in context, this is referring to the words of Revelation. Of course, this prophecy that it was given. But we know that God is referring as well to the entire spectrum of His Word because it's written in this book as a volume, amen? Revelation 22, look at verses 18 and 19. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the books of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. God is very clear. He said, don't mess with my words. There's a very sternness. I, I don't know if you can hear it, but I hear, and when I read it, I hear a sternness in the voice of God. Don't mess with my words. Don't mess with my words. And you know, we're going to get into a subject here in a second. Or a second. Um, it, not tonight, but next next week probably. But a, a lot of people immediately jump and say, that's right, all those other versions are wrong because they're missing words of God. And we're going to talk about that. Is that a circular argument? Because you know the other side will look at you and say, well, no, you added, wor you took a, you added words to the Word of God. Oh, well, who's right? Did we add words or did, we take, did they take away words? Who's right? What's the answer? We'll talk about that next week. But God was very clear. He said, do not add to my words. Don't touch them. That's why he said in Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 4, as it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. God said every word is of necessary value to you. You need it. You can't live by some of the words. You need every word. And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that next week on who has the right amount of words. Number four, God's word God's Word is our, and we've already mentioned this, our sole authority in all matters of faith and practice. You say, how do you know that? How can you prove that from Scripture? If we go back, and we've already read it, so I'll just read it to you for sake of time. But 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. If I can very simply say this, if I can boil it down, and you've heard me say it before in other series, but doctrine is what's right, Reproof, it's what's wrong. Correction is how to get right. Instruction is how to stay right. Amen. You tell me, what area of life is not covered in one of those four? It covers every <laughs> spectrum of life. So that tells me that what do I do when I don't know what to do? I go back to the Word of God because it's my sole authority. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on in the study. And number five, here's the last one I'll give you. Number five. God, we see God inspired His Word. His words are perfect and pure. We should not add to or take away from His Word. And then we saw, we saw the one we just talked about. And then number five, God promised He would preserve His Word. God promised He would preserve His Word. How many of you know someone who cans, they preserve things. Anybody know somebody like that? They can, they preserve things. They get that, they get their harvest, whatever it may be. Let's say it's blueberries and they're going to preserve those blueberries. Maybe they're going to make jams. Maybe they're going to make a jelly. Who knows what they're going to make, but they're going to preserve those blueberries. And so they're going to take them and they're going to go through the process of preserving or canning them. And they're going to take them and they're going to make it to where they last. They don't fade away. They don't rot. If you do it right, they don't rot, all right? They, they're preserved. They're going to last, all right? Have you heard stories, horror stories of people who preserve things and it wasn't preserved? And, um, but let me tell you something. We go back. God said He would preserve His Word, and we'll look at this from the Word of God in a second. But if God said He would preserve His Word, does that mean He could do it imperfectly? No, because God doesn't do anything imperfectly. Everything God does is perfect. So that tells me He didn't just preserve His Word. Like we would preserve something, I'd be scared half to death, especially preserving meat. Oh my goodness. I, I wouldn't trust myself. But I don't have to worry about myself because I'm not doing the process of preser preservation. God said, I will preserve my Word. How do I know that? How do I know that? He said He'll keep it to all generations. Look at Isaiah chapter 40. We'll flip to a couple passages, and then I'll read you a couple others. Isaiah chapter 40. You've heard this passage before, uh, who knows how many times, but Isaiah 40 and verse number 8 says, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. 
The word of our God shall stand forever. Turn to Psalm 119. You know this passage as well. Psalm 119, of course, the longest chapter of the Bible. Psalm 119, and look at verse number 89. Psalm number 89, it says, Psalm 119, verse 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. How, for how long? Forever. Turn over one more time to Ecclesiastes. We're right there in the Old Testament, so just turn back over a couple books to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse number 14 says this, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken away from, or taken from it. And God doeth it, that men should fear before Him. I love the first part of that verse. It's a wonderful verse. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. If God did this word, which He did, you're holding it in your hand, it shall be forever. Give you, I'll read you a couple more, write down the references. Matthew 5.18 says, Matthew 5.18, For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. By the way, we're still waiting for portions of this law to be fulfilled. Amen. So, uh, Matthew 24, verse 35 says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse number 23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. God very clearly said He has preserved His Word. It will last. It will stand forever. It's settled. It has been preserved. And God's got an eternal copy of it right up there in heaven. Amen. It's preserved. And the Bible says it's preserved in heaven. It's settled. It's done. God said He would preserve it to all generations. God said He would preserve it. So that means if it's preserved then we must still have the Word of God today. Aren't you thankful for that thought? There's so many people who question, you know, we'll get into this in a, a later on, but there's so many people who say, we don't have the Word of God today. It, it was lost generations ago and, and, and just it tattered and torn and it faded away in the sands of Egypt. And uh, we don't have the Word of God. We just got what we think is the Word of God. No, God said that His Word will stand forever. And he did it, and he did it perfectly. I know that what God doeth, it'll last forever, Ecclesiastes. Let me tell you something. God said he would preserve his word. So you can know that there is a word of God that has been perfectly preserved to all generations. Now this is going to lay the foundation as we begin to move forward into the rest of this series on the Bible version debate and making it simple. It's important that you build a foundation. Some people say, why not just jump into it and let's get right to it and let's pull out the other Bibles and do all that. Uh, we, we're not going to do that. You have to lay a foundation. You know why? Because I could get you into a series real quick. We could get it done in one night and boom, we'd be done. But you'd be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And when the rains came and the floods came up, the foolish man's house, as the song says, went splat. But the wise man, well, he built his house on the rock. You know what God equated that rock to? God said just the verse before, He said, Whoso heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them shall be likened unto a wise man who built his house on a rock, and his house stood firm. I want this to be something in your life. As I said, this is an important subject. I want this to be something that in your life, no matter what winds and waves beat upon it, it's something that stands firm in your life. The question is, in your life, what are you basing everything on? Are you basing it on the Word of God? Or are you basing it on your opinions and what you would rather? So many people say, well, I believe that Word of God. Oh, it's a great book. It's wonderful. But the truth is, when we walk out the door, so many people don't follow it. Can I tell you this? What does it really matter if you don't love and follow this book? Are you following it? Let me tell you, there, there is something in each of our lives, every single one of us tonight, including myself, where we're not following this as closely as we should be. Oh, we should get on our knees and say, God, before any of the rest of this, I'm going to follow this book. Maybe it's not being as compassionate. I can struggle with that. How about you? Sometimes, oh, I can struggle with compassion. I can struggle with pride. I can struggle with selfishness. I can struggle with things that shouldn't be in my life. 
why don't we just first, before the rest of it, say, God, I'll follow your word. I won't let one word of it fail. That was Job. He said, I won't let one word of that fail. He said, I esteem thy word more than my necessary food. Oh, let us be like that man who was able when that enemy came and came all the way through. Can I tell you, I think Job just put on and strapped on that suit of armor and he took that word of God. He said, I'm not going to let one word of God fail because I'm going to stand strong. You can be like that man too when you begin to develop a stance on the Word with the sword of the Spirit. It's a big subject. So we'll pick it up, uh, not next week, because we have an uh, evangelist coming in. Looking forward to that. What a wonderful service it's going to be. The week after that, we'll pick back up on the series, and uh, we'll review that. And uh, we're going to answer this question. When you go into a Bible bookstore or you go somewhere and you see all those different Bible translations, the KJV, the NIV, the New King James, the ESV, the MEV, the uh, NASB, the, all these Bible translations, and, you know, AmericanBible.org said there were over 900. But I'll tell you this, there's actually only two. You say, What? How? They say over 900. Why are you saying there's only two? You'll have to come back next time to find out about why there are actually two.